so what we're going to talk about is looking at um, one of the tools or one of the strategies we have for helping to reverse the decline that I was talking about earlier in coral reefs. And it's one that's gained a lot of popularity recently, but it's largely untested. So we're going to um, talk a little bit about uh, the, the potential for this as a tool for helping to reverse the decline of, of reefs. Um, so the, the coral species that we're focused on in this are Elkhorn and Staghorn coral, so shallow water coral species. Um, for everyone that saw Dr. Ray's talk last night, he has some incredible video of uh, these species in the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park um, back in the day before it was a park, and we really just don't see that anymore. These photos I have here are the, the two healthiest stands that I found in the Bahamas, um, but they really just don't compare to what, what it used to be like. Um, so the reason why we're interested in these species, um, they are extremely important reef builders, um, so they create habitat for fish and other reef creatures. Um, part of the reason why they're so important is because they are the most rapid growing of the, the coral species here. Um, and Elkhorn coral I'll highlight as being particularly important for some of the ecosystem services it provides in terms of um, building that reef crest zone where, where you see waves breaking, so providing shoreline protection. Um, However, we also see that both species have declined um, since the 70s and 80s by over 90 percent, uh, more for staghorn than for elkhorn, um, so they are considered to be endangered species now. Um, and they largely died off due to outbreaks of disease that occurred back then, associated also with climate change and that kind of thing. And we're really not seeing recovery of these species um, like, we, like we should. Uh, so, one of the tools we have for helping to bring these species back is um, rehabilitating their populations. Um, and this is kind of a, a typical example of what the, these stands look like now. This is actually from the Exuma Park, where there used to be a huge stand of Elkhorn coral at the very southern end of the park, and now we just see a few tiny remnants remaining for that. Um, so we want to look and see if we can speed up the recovery of these species which um, should help create habitat for other species and restore ecosystem function and really jumpstart the recovery of, of some of these reefs in general. Um, but we don't know how effective these efforts are um, and we don't know the spatial and temporal scales over which this kind of rehabilitation is possible. So the, the research I'm going to talk about is stuff, again, that um, I've been doing with a, a team from Disney uh, centered around their uh, island that their cruise line has in southern Abaco, uh, Gorda Key, or as they call it, Castaway Key. Um, and we have a number of reefs in that area where we've been working um, since around 2007. And I'm going to really, in this talk, just focus on um, reefs, uh, Glass Bottom Reef and Midway Reef are two of our uh, rehabilitation reefs that we've been doing over the, this time period. And then we have a couple other control reefs in the area. Um, basically, the reefs are spread out between Gorda Key and, and Sandy Point Abaco. So um, this project actually started in 2007 when um, people from Disney realized the, the poor state of the reefs in that area. And they were talking to me about what we can do to help bring them back. And um, they were dominated by macroalgae, so we first tried uh, bringing back the, the long spine sea urchin, Diadema antelarum. But we quickly realized that these reefs had degraded to the point where they were losing the complex structure needed to support Diadema and other populations. So we really needed to, to shift gears and go into um, trying to bring the corals back directly, which would help then bring back some of these other species and sort of uh, go into this feedback loop. So in 2008, we started directly transplanting corals um, from other reefs in the area where there were some okay populations of uh, elkhorn and staghorn coral onto these reefs. And we did this from 2008 to 2010, but in this, uh, these graphs show the amount of uh, elkhorn coral and number of staghorn corals we put out on these reefs over time, and you can see that we really just weren't getting enough uh, pieces of corals. We were relying on naturally fragmented pieces to, 
to transplant onto these reefs. So we decided we would have to, to do more to help grow the coral. So we established in 2011 some coral nurseries where we would take these naturally fragmented pieces, um, fragment them further, grow them in a nursery, and I'll show you some pictures of that, and then outplant them to the reefs after they reach the size of about uh, 10 to 15 centimeters. Um, and this actually was fairly effective at increasing the number of corals we could outplant on a reef. Um, for elkhorn coral, it, it jumped up. Um, elkhorn coral is a little slower growing, though, than staghorn coral. So um, over time, we scaled down the amount of elkhorn coral in the nursery and really focused more on staghorn coral. Um, but you can see here we had a, a tremendous increase. This uh, decrease in 2015 in the numbers we put out is not due to less coral production in the nurseries, but we started doing experiments looking at what the optimal size for uh, putting corals out on the reef were. So we were transplanting at some much larger sizes than we'd done in the past. So this is what the nursery that we're using up at Castaway Key looks like. Um, basically, we're taking naturally fragmented corals, cutting them into small pieces, um, suspending them on lines where they can grow at different depths in the water column where we see greatly accelerated growth rates over their natural growth rates. Um, and this is something that's being done with a variety of different nursery designs here in the Bahamas and elsewhere, um, coral tree nurseries and other things in the Florida Keys um, and other programs here in the Bahamas too. But what we can do then is, um, oops, go back. Uh, grow the corals, there, um, from a, a three to five centimeter piece of coral. Um, after a year of growth, uh, this is against a one centimeter grid, so you can see it's over 30 centimeters. We can then cut off the new growth, um, outplant that, those two pieces out to the reef, leave the original nub basically to regrow, and it can sustainably grow over time. And each year we found we're getting increasing amounts of um, branches to outplant. Um, so this is looking at a time series over three years. Um, and this is what that same piece looked like last year. Um, and from this, like I said, we could have, if we kept to the 10 to 15 centimeter branches out planting, I think this would have been about 12 or 13. Um, but instead we put it out as I think two or three pieces instead. Um, so, it's just showing you the outplanting. What we do is um, we use a two-part epoxy to attach the coral branch to the substrate. Um, we have each one labeled so we can go back and measure its growth over time. And this is just a time series for a piece of staghorn coral. Um, that's one year of growth. That's the second year. And then that's a, a third year of growth. And we see uh, similar patterns for Elkhorn coral, where we can start again with a 10 to 15 bran centimeter branch that we uh, cut off the nursery. Um, one year growth, two, and three years of growth. So if we look at the, the total amount of coral that we've outplanted, to these reefs um, in terms of the volume of the coral. So uh, using a calculation, what's called ecological volume. So it's just a calculation based on the length, width, and height of each piece of coral. Um, the red line there shows the amount of coral that we've actually put at the time that we put it out on the reef. Um, and this is a, a cumulative amount, so it's building from each year to the next. Um, and the blue lines are what we measure each year when we go back and um, look at how much coral is there. So if there was no growth and no mortality of corals, the blue bars would track this red line uh, exactly the same. But we do have significant amounts of growth of coral. Um, but what we see when we look at that at the two different reef sites on our pilot study, um, it's not uh, the same thing isn't happening at both reefs. Uh, at the glass bottom reef, um, and I, I want to point out there's different scales on these y-axes too, but at glass bottom reef we see a little bit of growth, but it really doesn't compare to, to midway, um, the effectiveness of the growth out there. So we wanted to look at why there's a less uh, 
total amount of coral and why it actually is starting to decrease at glass bottom over Midway Reef. So first we look at survival of corals. Um, and uh, in this, these graphs, the blue is glass bottom, red is Midway Reef, and we see that uh, survival um, for staghorn coral dropped off considerably at glass bottom and uh, was very high at Midway. And the same sort of thing, although in a more, uh, over time, more linear pattern for um, Elkhorn coral as well, where the survival was just much lower at glass bottom reef. And looking at growth rates, we see the opposite thing, where we see much greater growth rates um, at Midway Reef than at Glass Bottom Reef over time. So the question then is, um, why the difference between sites? And we looked at a number of different variables, and I'm not going to get into all the details. We looked at water temperature and proximity to the key and different threats like that. But the, the main thing that we found was driving a lot of this um, were these guys that I mentioned in my previous talk. These uh, coral-eating snails um, that can wipe out corals over uh, the course of days with the size that we're out planting corals. Um, and we see up to uh, from 1 to 20 of these snails um, at a time on a, any individual coral. So looking at what the impact of these snails were, um, these graphs up here are the same survival graphs I showed for Elkhorn coral and for staghorn coral. And the bottom ones show for the same two reefs the, uh, an index of the density of snails, the delta density of these snails. And we see that um, corresponding with this linear decrease in Elkhorn coral, we see uh, almost a similar increase in the amount of snails on the corals. Um, and I want to add, too, that we're removing snails from the coral. So um, these are new snails coming in um, from surrounding corals to infect the ones that we've put out there. Uh, and for uh, staghorn coral, we see this drop off during the first year at uh, Glass Bottom Reef, which does correspond with our biggest peak in snail densities here. Um, and just to add that th these are two very different scales on the y-axis. Um, the staghorn coral is much more sensitive to snail predation because it has much less surface area than the elkhorn coral. Um, so the next thing we wanted to look at um, is how do the nursery corals compare to natural corals. Um, and just to, to go over this real quick, if we, um, sorry to use the same colors, but uh, in this, these graphs, blue is for the corals from the nursery and red is the direct transplant ones, again, from the same year uh, of outplanting, uh, there was no significant difference over time um, in the survival rates. They both survived equally well. We do, however, see differences in growth rates, and um, we see opposite things happening for each of the two coral species, where it, um, the staghorn coral, uh, the direct transplants where we took corals, um, broke off a piece of an existing colony and epoxied it to the reef in the same area where we were putting our nursery corals. They had much higher growth rate than the nursery corals. Um, doing the same thing for the elkhorn coral, though, we see the opposite, where the nursery corals did better. Um, and we're currently looking into this on uh, if this is related to the growth conditions in the nursery or, or what's causing these effects. Um, we really don't know yet. Um, so what are the implications of this? Well, um, it shows that, yeah, we can grow corals in nurseries, and they can be effective for repopulating these species, but there's a lot of caveats. Um, first, that some sites are definitely better than others um, in terms of their suitability for uh, this sort of rehabilitation, uh, repopulation efforts. Um, and the other thing is that uh, with the nurseries that we're using right now, it's really only possible to do this on local scales. So the next steps we're looking at are, one is looking at other potential species. We've done some preliminary experiments with uh, other species like this Dendrogyra. Um, we are looking at what can be done to control snail populations. Uh, we're incorporating climate change adaptation into these efforts where we are um, 
looking at these thermal stress maps of the Bahamas, and we've collected corals throughout the Bahamas to look at um, genetics both of the corals and of the symbiotic uh, algae associated with them to see if we can see some uh, adaptations to thermal stress. And then finally, uh, trying to scale this up. And one of the things we're looking at doing with that is um, a project to collect coral spawn, raise the larvae, get the juveniles to settle, raise those, and be able to outplant um, a couple hundred thousands of corals at a time instead of a couple hundred. And I'll end there. And just uh, this is what Midway Reef looks like now, where before there was no staghorn coral, and now we, we do have some healthy populations that are actually starting to be reproductive. Thank you.